we are calling the meeting to order of this um, special meeting of the Marin Municipal Board of Directors. Um, as an initial matter, I'm going to apologize to everybody, including all of you in Movie Land. I don't usually bring my lunch to these meetings, but I have been straight through this morning, so I'm just going to ask for everybody's um, indulgence and patience. I promise not to chew loudly. Um, uh, with that, I need a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Right. Is Larry on the phone? No. Director Do we still need a vote? Okay. Director Bragg? Aye. Director Gibson? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Russell, are you there? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 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 Okay. Um, now is the moment for public expression. I want to be sure that everybody realizes this is the moment for public expression for items not on the agenda. There will be significant opportunity for public expression for items that are agendized. Good afternoon. Paul Primo with cost. I want to again renew our request that you video these meetings. We've been doing it off and on over the last two or three months. <clears throat> Very easy to do. It provides transparency on what goes on here. It lets people know who is here to attend the meeting, and uh, we urge you to do that. Along those same lines, the Marine IJ has a column called In Your Town. Every week they report on meetings of public agencies and generally what's being held. You should also, we ask, include participating in that notice. Let the public know what when your meeting is, uh, even though it changes occasionally, like this one, uh, and what the subject matters are that are going to be discussed. So we urge you to do both of those things for transparency and to fulfill your role as an agency of the public. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further items for public expression not on the agenda? Okay. That brings us to the minutes of the March 13th meeting. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Director Bergman. Aye. Wait, wait, wait. I just want, I just want to make sure we don't have any public comment on this item. I have one other comment. I'm sorry. I just looked at the uh, handouts. You have several very dense charts in the handout for this meeting. What's available in the agenda online? I personally can't even read the numbers. I urge you again to not just have the agenda available three, three days before the meeting, at least as soon as possible before the meeting, early as possible, get these charts out. I don't know if I'll have a chance to look at them, let alone understand them, and intelligently comment on them today. Thank you. Is there any other item on this actual agenda item, which is the minutes of the March 13th meeting? Okay, seeing none, roll call. <coughs> Director Bragman? Aye. Director Gibson? Aye. Director Kohler? Aye. Director Russell? Okay. This brings us to item two, the monthly financial update. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. <coughs> Starting with our revenues at 75% of the fiscal year, we see that water revenue is at 78.4, but as we've discussed before, uh, we get the bulk of those revenues earlier in the year, and one of the things that's notable is that our sales are down 1% uh, for the year uh, compared year over year. And so we'll see how it progresses throughout the rest of this fiscal year with the extensive rains that we had in the winter time. For our expenditures, we're tracking, tracking along with budget. Uh, the one area that I would point out is uh, under capital allocation and uh, district projects, uh, due to the reprioritizing of the 19 budget for capital programs uh, from 36 million to 20 million, uh, that number is lower, plus trying to right size it, as you'll see in a future slide. We're about 16 plus million dollars for the year, so we're tracking along to the 20 million number, but the 36 million dollar number is, is affecting uh, our year to year uh, budget to actual. So, under ending, ending reserves, uh, again, that's influenced by um, 
our uh, capital spending. Uh, overall, our operating unrestricted uh, is showing higher. However, our overall total reserves are at 76.5. Uh, the month's reserve is at 4.5. We'd expect that to come down a bit before the end of the fiscal year as we see the slowdown in revenues. Uh, we're projecting our debt service coverage to be 1.4. That's held steady for a little while now. Uh, our total debt is at $155 million. Under capital expenditures, um, really it's just showing the reprioritization and the um, and the attempt to uh, make sure that we have capital funding uh, for emergencies in the future instead of just uh, taking it down to zero. We um, are showing $16.5 million spent through this fiscal year. And that's our update for the, for the month. Charlie, on the uh, unrestricted, <coughs> undesignated funds, um, those essentially are with, uh, those are retained earnings. Those are net earnings. That's on page <coughs> eight under the reserve balance summary. Uh, it, that also including the beginning balance from the year prior. Yes. Okay. And that looks like it's gone up somewhat. Uh, yes, uh, we are uh, being very careful with this year's budget until we have a good idea. Um, of what the rates will be for moving into next year. We're trying to hold things as tight as possible uh, just to make sure we're ready for emergencies, uh, depending on what rates will be. I understand. <coughs> but there has been an increase in that uh, fund, correct? Uh, yes, that's right now, yes. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Any other board comment on the update? Any public comment on this item? Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. We do a public item comment Paul on this item. Paul Bramble again. Uh, I'm just wondering about your cash balances. How much money do you have in the cash balance from the proceeds of debt uh, and any surpluses of payments or expenses? Net of encumbrances? Well, I'd like both if you can. So we have $76.5 million currently in our operating reserve, to, uh, total reserve, which includes $24 million of capital. So $76.5 includes the 24 It does. Thank you. Just making sure, no further public comment on the monthly financial update. Okay. This brings us to item three, which are the four related um, options for the capital maintenance fee. Um, yeah, this, so this is all one agendized item, the four options. So I think we'll just have you do the presentation. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let's pull it up right now. All right, so today's presentation, we're going to cover four options or four rate related issues. Uh, the first is potential phasing of the capital maintenance fee, uh, collection op options for the CMF, uh, upsized residential meters due to non uh, consumption purposes, and then uh, non ratepayer funded programs, specifically the low income uh, waiver program and the super saver program. And then at the end, we'll have staff recommendations. So for phasing the CMF, we looked at what a two-year and a three-year would be as far as uh, cost to the capital program. The, a two-year phase-in would have the first year, so $8.25 million uh, would not go into the capital fund. Uh, and a three-year phase-in would result in $16.72 million not going to the capital fund. So just to be clear, um, because you just sort of jumped right in, yeah. this assumes that the capital maintenance fee would be as proposed, the 163 
yes. per household. Yes, a full sixteen and a half million dollars for the first year. Okay. If uh, if it was cut by fifty or thirty three percent. So uh, what this chart, the top part of it, shows no phasing, uh, just as you were talking about. If we started with the full CMF in the first year and indexed it according to the ENR, uh, we did assume a maximum 4%, which is what it's capped at at an annual, just to see what the, the highest would be. The lower section that says five-year phasing under the second blue line uh, shows if we take the CMF and we ramp it up 20%, 40%, up to 100%, and in a five-year period and then 100% after that. And what it would show in both one-inch meter and the five-eighths-inch meter, both annually and bi-monthly. So you'll see the five-eighths meter, five meter bi-monthly charge is $27.25 at the full 100% CMF. At the five-year phase in at 20% is $5.45 and ramps up uh, from there to the 100% at the five years. We did look at two other scenarios, which would be a 10-year phasing, going 10% each year till we reach the 100%. Uh, also, uh, what a 50-50 uh, would be, meaning collect 50% and bond fund 50%. I should point out, uh, first on this, you can't see it as well on the screen. Um, in year 2020, uh, the five-year phasing, uh, in order to replace the money that would be foregone by going 20% CMF, uh, we could fill that with a bond issue of $21.5 million. In 2022, it'd be a $7.1 million bond issue, and then after a year, uh, after those years, we wouldn't have to borrow anymore because we'd be reaching the 100%. And so that would keep our capital program whole. It would add about $28.6 million worth of debt and about $27.2 million of interest over the 30 years that we'd be paying on those bonds. <coughs> so when we look at the 10-year phasing in the 50-50, in the you see that uh, we have additional amount bonded in millions. It's the third line down. Uh, so for a 10-year phasing, we'd start at $26.6 million in borrowed funds, then 20, 15, seven and a half, for a total of $70 million in additional bond principal, and 30, uh, the 30-year 30 interest cost being $66.6 .6 million. If we went the half and half, uh, we would add $86 million in debt, and a, a total interest cost of $81.9, uh, $82 million. <coughs> So Charlie, this is a lot of numbers. Do you do you have a, anything that just sort of summarizes so we can see each of these options with the bottom line about the costs associated with each? <clears throat> On here we have the um, amount bonded. So if we did the hundred mm -hmm. percent, uh, we would have no no money bonded. Um, so that would be along this line, mm -hmm. and then amount bonded here. Okay. It uh, it looks great shaded on my computer screen. Yeah, I'm sure it does. I apologize about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then looking at the bi-monthly cost, twenty-seven dollars and uh, twenty-five cents here, versus a five-year phase-in would be five dollars and forty-five cents. Those are the two that really stick out. For okay. Those rows. All right. Thanks. So um, again, here in the 10-year phasing, we're looking at bond issues during these years. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we typically do a bond, we're looking at covering two years with those bonds. So whatever is left over is factored into all of these calculations. Um, you'll see we do start paying the following year on our debt service. But really, we're looking at what is, how does it affect the charges by phasing it in? Are we, are we easing the, the pain on the ratepayers, and what's the corresponding trade-off by taking on more debt. Um, we did include here uh, the totals for you, and I'll make sure you all have copies of these before you leave today. So, Charlie, on the 
on the debt funding uh, scenarios, 5, uh, 10, and 50, 50. So over that same period of time, we're still paying down existing debt, correct? Yes, we would be. Uh, our debt payments are relatively flat, though. We don't pay a lot of principal off until really almost 2040. Uh, we, uh, we do pay down principal, but the way our debt's structured, we have pretty flat year-to-year -year debt payments. And so we may take off about $200,000 by the 2030s, and then we'll see it drop off maybe by a million or so in 2040. So it's the way it's structured right now, it's very flat going out a long way. When do we start <clears throat> eating into the actual principal? We, uh, we, well, we are making principal payments every time we make a payment, but the way the debt is structured is um, it's, uh, some of it is interest only till 2030, right. so we're not making any uh, principal payments for one of the bonds. And uh, again, it's, uh, we don't have year-to-year -year debt drop-off, so right now we're spending about $10 million a year. We're going to spend $10 million a year without additional debt for the foreseeable future until sometime in 2030s. And then we'll see it go down to uh, eight million or nine million seven hundred thousand for a few years, and then as we approach twenty forty, we'll get down to about seven and a half million dollars. And so the per year of principal payment, uh, <coughs> per year of debt payment, and that includes I both see. principal and interest. Mm -hmm. I see. So I'm just wondering, you know, given um, really the the benefit to the ratepayer of, of doing some additional debt financing. If at some point we could see kind of what our total debt picture looks like year to year, if we got into this, because it seems to me it's almost like coming up with an algorithm where we keep our total debt um, exposure within reasonable limits and then try to spread it out to where it eventually sort of balances out and we just are at that point of sustainable uh, cash and debt financing. So, um, which seems like a fairly complicated um, uh, uh, calculation or to come up with, but. Yeah, uh, certainly I can take a look at that. Um, the 50-50, the does show uh, <coughs> if we collected just the 50% of the CMF, of course that's indexed still going to the ENR, and took on 50% debt. Uh, it does add $86 million to our overall debt picture and would add um, the $82 million in interest cost over the 30 years. Really it becomes 40 years because when you think it's 8 years, almost 10 years out when we do the last bond issue, so 30 years from that is 40 years from today, um, I can give you what the year, um, each yearly uh, um, total debt payment, annual debt payment is. I can I can give that to you because that's part of uh, putting this together. But in that same time frame, we're also paying 10 million a year against existing debt. So I mean, I know it's not a wash, but it seems like we're sort of approaching. Um, at least arithmetically, it's, it, it's sort of a wash. So, uh, well, uh, in 2029, we would be at. And 2029, we'd be at 15.6 million dollars a year in debt service, because we'd be adding um, a million this year, a million this year, 1.9. Every time we do debt, it'll go up. So when we release this, we go up to three million dollars extra a year. When we do 18.8, uh, we go up another 1.2 to 4.2. So by 2029, we'll have an additional yearly payment of $5.6 million cumulative from all of these debt issues going out another 30 years. So and eventually, so, at, eventually, as let's say we kept on that 50 50, eventually we're going to, the old bonds are going to start falling off. And I know it's, you know, we're talking about a decade or two away, yes. but that's going to go down, and at some point we're going to kind of stabilize. 
I, I'll have to think about that some. Yeah, because uh, uh, I'm just not, I'm not really sure if you can reach a stabilization. Um, you, uh, at some point, um, your rates will have to make sure you cover the debt service, of right. course, and I'd want to look at that to be able to really comment on Correct. it. Correct. And, uh, you know, but I just think the whole goal of this process is to come up with an equitable and sustainable financial structure for MMWB, and, you know, that may take some years to do. So, what I can tell you, what I'm used to as far as uh, a debt, using debt as a plan, is that. Um, most uh, the capital improvement program, as, as Mike <coughs> has presented to you several times, is maintaining what we have right now. And so typically that would be out of rates, um, whether a CMF or bi multi rate. You know, um, the CMF would do a good job of, of sustaining the, the, we call them improvements, but it's basically uh, new stuff or old stuff that's failing. So where would you use bond debt? You would use it for the major projects, like your plant projects that, that we have, or something completely unexpected, natural disaster kind of thing, or to do a catch up every now and then, meaning if we're doing five years of pipe replacements every year and we think that seven might be good, but we can't afford seven every year, maybe every five years we do a bond issue and we catch up a little and we do eight for two years or something like that. Miles per year. Miles per year, sorry. Uh, so that's using debt as a tool to supplement the rates, paying for the ongoing maintenance, such as, you know, if we, uh, when I met with the school system, they talked about they have so many schools, they know they have to replace three roofs a year, so they budget that, and they don't necessarily borrow for that. They're trying to borrow for bigger ticket items or, or unexpected things that they really have to do. So. That's uh, so going with a proposition of 50 50 is a little bit out of the norm in that balancing because what we're talking about are the <coughs> routine maintenance items, uh, not the unexpected things such as the seismic retrofit of a plant made uh, that was built in 1960. So, the benefits to the consumer is really kind of a mixed bag. I mean, you can argue it either way. It seems to me, right? I mean, because there are significant costs to the consumer um, of, of, you know, piling on this additional debt. We know there's going to need to be debt for all of the reasons you just listed. So the question is, what what is the financial, um, you know, what is the equitable thing from the consumer perspective, given the higher costs associated with taking on more debt to perform what is, as you've described it. Um, a significant amount of the routine maintenance that, of course, we have been doing for the last number of decades and will continue to need to do going forward. So one of the things that, that I look at uh, when I'm balancing, say, the 100% versus something like this is at 100% you're paying for 10 years of projects and uh, you have 10 years of pro projects accomplished. When you take on the debt, you have 10 years of projects accomplished, but you're paying for it over 30 years. Right. And so there is an interest cost to that, but at the end of the 10 years, you still have this ongoing cost, and you still have then a need to finance the next 10 years of projects. And so I understand that's why you're saying trying to come to some equilibrium, yeah. um, but that's one of the considerations that I would say is, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's why I do think we need to wean ourselves from the every two years of borrowing 100% of our capital program because I don't think that's sustainable and I would not recommend that. Um, taking on some debt to ease the burden of the slamming in of a capital maintenance fee, I can see that being manageable. Uh, the numbers show we can handle the debt um, and then you know if we can get to roughly 100%, what we know is that's 100% of what we're saying is our capital program, which is ongoing maintenance of the things we have. The, we still may have need to look at debt after 10 years for those unexpected <laughs> things. By then, our 1960 uh, treatment plants are going to be another 10 years older. Right, uh, right. So, so things like that, uh, we will have, uh, and then also emergencies. Right. It is another area that we need to preserve some access to if we have a serious emergency sure. and we need to go to the market. Sure, so there's, there's really no piece to it then, right? This just goes on. And, and that's true for really every 
Um, every water agency, whether it's you know like ours, drinking water, stormwater, wastewater. I mean, it you know the the need for debt, the need for capital to deal with both our ongoing maintenance and for all of the things you've described goes on. So I, I guess again, the question is just you know we just need to be very transparent. I think with the public about the cost of debt and you know how that gets because we already, as you said, we already have debt. It's not as though we're going to an all cash system. There always will be debt, um, and the question is. Um, you know, for what we're trying to accomplish, whether it makes sense to take on additional debt. And I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm still not completely clear about how it works from an equity perspective. Both, uh, you know, just generational equity, but also, uh, you know, just fiscal, fiscal health. I'm, I'm still not really Well, if we, if we go, if we did get to 50-50, that's a big improvement over where we are now, yeah. which is 100%. And the other thing that factors into it for our district is we have a relatively small ratepayer base. So I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't agree with you, Larry. Okay, well, can we, can we, I'm sorry, can I interrupt just for a second? I just want to make sure everybody can hear Larry Russell. Larry, we can't hear you, so could I just want to stop you so that we can make sure that you're, everybody can hear you. We have a pretty good crowd here. So, if you could was, just finish his comment. Oh, I was still talking, but that's fine. It's okay, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the relatively small ratepayer base, I think, gives us a little more incentive to leverage our financial, our revenue stream by looking into, you know, getting to that sweet spot, getting to that point of equilibrium that I was talking about earlier, where we're slowly paying down what we've got and not incurring additional debt that will keep us under water. But I think that's where we just, just so I, I, I think I'm not following because there, I think we just discussed this, but there really isn't gonna be a piece of it. We're always going to have to be incurring debt every couple of years to deal with. True, but our total debt, if we spread it out, would mm -hmm. be reduced. Yeah. What did, but not for a while. Larry, yeah, but, yeah, but not for a long time. Right, and Larry right. did have a point. He didn't. Larry on the phone had a point to make, please. Yeah, well, it's real simple. You know, it's that old story about if you want to stop digging the hole, stop, stop digging with the shovel, huh? And it seems to me that because we're only paying interest for the next 10 years, the easiest way to force financial stability is to stop borrowing. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't, I, I don't understand the logic. I understand the impact. And I have empathy for the impact, but the problem I have is, is it worth $81 million to create this smoothing of the integration of the CMF? And, and to me, I, I just don't feel the value of $81 million of interest for that smoothing. What percentage of our bonding is uh, interest only? Uh, 10%? Yeah, I'd have to check that. It's 100% of the 12 or 16. I think it was the 2012 borrowing. The, the 2012 borrowing was 100% interest only until I think it's 2032. Um, and it, it makes sense when you look at what the conditions were then and we had a hole in our, in our debt plan that that nicely filled. So, so it did make sense. But taken out of context, it sounds a little bit off. Why are we only paying interest for this long time? Part of it was to smooth out our annual uh, total debt payment. Total debt payment is always going to include uh, principal and interest. In this case, no principal and all interest for the 2012. 2016 and 2017, we are paying a mixture of principal and interest all the time. <laughs> I, I think what I would just say, um, because this is coming later and I, I feel comfortable to say it, is you know, right now, staff has a recommendation of doing the five-year phasing, with, which in conjunction with the four-year check-in gives the board a good opportunity to say, okay, are there other opportunities here to restructure how we're going forward as far as taking on debt, trying to balance it more, um, giving us a better picture, a more robust asset management plan to give you a really good 
picture of aging infrastructure, how well it's aging, or uh, if, if increasing problems. So I would say that the combination of the two seem to make sense to us from a staff perspective as making a recommendation. However, of course, we're giving you multiple options sure. because they exist. So right. just yes. sorry. Go ahead. So just to um, get back to Larry Russell's point, he sort of put it very succinctly. It's basically, it's, it's, I just want to make sure, just a kind of a reality check. Is my sense is that is that the way Larry described it is what you are proposing. That it basically is an eighty million dollar cost for this, this essentially the smoothing function with the five year phase. And so let's just start there. Is that are we all on the same page? As a matter of fact, no, it's actually less. Uh, that was the five year phase, and there's only that's 27. the tenure. Okay, yeah. so the 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 smoothing cost for the five year phase in is. 27, 27 million. million. Okay, so that's a different number. So, Larry, I just want to make sure we're on the same page about that. Are you? I appreciate that. Okay, so we're at the. So it's twenty-seven million is the cost of the smoothing of the smooth phase in. Um, five year. On the five year, which is the staff recommendation. That's my. That's that is the recommendation. It is. Okay, so then I guess the question is. So that's the fact. That's the you know that creates the fact floor. So then the question is: Is that is that a reasonable cost? You know, I mean, that, that's really kind of a policy, that sort of subjective policy question is, you know, is the, with the benefit that um, the consumers receive really more than the district? Um, because it really comes down at this point to the hit on the consumers. The, the district is going to have what it needs either way. So the question is, 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 the, is the 27 million an appropriate price to pay for the benefit of the smoothing? I think that's where we are, right? I, I agree with that completely, Cynthia. And let's put it in a simple-minded perspective. I mean, it, twenty-seven million dollars would pay off all of the rest of the Redwood Tank conversion to steel tanks. It would buy twenty-seven miles of pipeline, and and so forth. You know, it's it's a five years of the fire flow fund. I mean, you know, like I say, I, to me. You know, we, we, and I agree completely with what Charlie said, we made, I believe, a very wise decision several years ago to take advantage of the extremely low interest rates. And, but in our planning, it, was, it wasn't conceived that we would incur additional debt in the immediate future downstream of that refinancing that we did back then at the low interest rates. So, you know, we're, we're kind of, I think, we're kind of twisting the, the issues here. And like I said, you know, it's, and I agree completely, Cynthia, it is completely a managerial decision of is it worth spending $27 million to achieve this goal? And, and my feeling is it's not, but, you know, I'm open, my ears are open. Can I just say one thing? It's $27 million over 30 years, which is less than a million a year, so that's less than a mile of pipe a year. So I don't think, I think you do have to take the cost and the, the time frame into account in, in talking about the numbers. So we get the benefit of the capital right away, the payment is spread out over time, and for most of the ratepayers, you know, that does, it's not just a smoothing effect. That, that's on the equity, the equity side of the equitable and sustainable financial structure. So for the rate payer, uh, it's not really smoothing, it's just lowering their monthly bill. If I may just... You can't get in the future. Yeah, I mean, they're, the rate payer is paying it one way or another. Correct, but it's very, very incremental over <clears> the <throat> years, so it's, you know... But there's going to be the additional debt that comes. It, this is not the, it's not a one-time thing, so I, I mean. If I may just to add a bit to um, the staff recommendation on this item and some of the reasoning behind that staff is recommending a five-year ramp-up period for the CMF, it's essentially trying to strike the right balance, of course, between the impacts of the shift from 100% debt funding to 100% cash funding and doing that over a five-year period is a reasonable approach that does significantly lessen the year-to-year -year impact that this prudent approach to shift to cash funding, in my view, um, taking that direction, it just smooths the impact for both residents, for businesses that may have not planned for it, 
um, school districts and the like. So th that was some of the reasoning that staff was thinking about taking into consideration the board's expressed comments of looking at options to lessen the impact to our customer base, yet stay on course to um, move to cash funding on these routine expenditures that we do year after year. Okay, but just to clarify, and I just, I, I don't mean to be picky, Ben, but we're not moving to 100% cash funding. We are still going to incur debt over time. It's cash funding for routine maintenance. It, it, is that what you're getting at? That's correct. Okay. It's cash funding for the CIP as currently identified mm -hmm. with the understanding that a large complex enterprise such as we have here, right. there is invariably things that pop up that are more kind of <laughs> one-off issues that you have to deal with. It could be a decision to move forward with um, automated metering to save water and drive conservation. It may be unexpected uh, issues with our six dams. There's an array of issues that could and frankly over time will emerge um, and on those one-offs it is a um, industry practice for those to look at the generational type approach that you mentioned and assume some debt for those investments. Right, so you anticipate, but, 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 if but I could ben, just finish Larry, if, if you okay. take, yes. Um, <laughs> so you are assuming, what, what level of, of debt funding are you assuming, um, you know, notwithstanding this scenario, notwithstanding this approach to, um, to funding capital? If you're you're we, saying that we won't, so we've been doing, you know, bond issuances every couple of years. Are you assuming that that practice will cease? Because my sense is that we're going to continue to do that. It might be stretched out a little longer, but my expectation, given the capital needs that we have, um, you know, is that we're going to need, it's, it's not going to just be for emergencies. The current 10-year CIP Will, would be under the no phasing alternative, mm -hmm. the direction we've been headed, would be funded um, exclusively from the cash funding from both the CMF and the fire flow um, fee. Okay. So th that would be funding our program. Okay. But we do anticipate, um, given the age and condition of our system, regulatory pressures, um, emergency response scenarios that other demands will come at us and that would likely be the time staff would suggest to the board consideration of bond funding. Okay, I'm sorry Larry Russell, you were saying? Well, what I was saying is that isn't that Ben's argument exactly the reason to preserve the additional bonding capacity? Because you don't know when these events are going to occur and, and rather than maxing out the credit card now it seems to me a more prudent approach is to wait and, and let things move forward pay down your debt and then establish what the what the getting to larry's point what is the long-term debt funding plan it, it seems to me we're we're, we're kind of looking at our feet but we should be looking at the sky and you know we should be looking at the big picture not not this day-to-day -day issue of of uh, 10 or 20 dollars a month here or there well i just i want to jump in for a second you know we are paying down debt every year even though we're not hitting principal i mean it's just it's just the way these bonds are structured that we're not hitting principal so we're not Ignoring our our debt burden, um, the debt isn't reduced every year. But we are paying it down. Is all I'm saying. So technically, no, we're not going to we're not going to be eating into principal because of the way it's structured. What I think, as far as getting to that sweet spot of equity and sustainability, we've got to get to a point where we're incurring less debt than we have been, and having some cash financing from the ratepayers in order to get to that point where we're at the sustainable revenue stream. So I don't think we're ever going to eliminate debt. I mean, even if we went to 100% uh, cash financing now, we've still got debt. Right. If you look at the five-year phasing, 
um, our debt coverage ratio actually uh, is fine. It's we're in good shape there, and I think you know that that's another thing. Really, I don't think that's understood by the public, which is these debt agreements require the district to actually um, have what's called debt coverage ratio, which essentially is creating a surplus. Beyond of, of 25 to 50 percent beyond your operating costs, so that has an impact on rates. That's unavoidable. So, you know, there's good aspects of debt. There's bad aspects of debt. It's the gift that keeps on taking, as everybody's pointed out. So, again, it's it's to me, it's really we're going to need some more analysis as we go through the process. I have one other question, which is given our retained earnings whether we could use some of them to delay um, getting or, uh, getting additional debt. So if we delayed it for a year, we could have a six-year phase in or a seven-year phase in. So that's something else I would just like to discuss with staff as we go through the process because I think it is a process oh, yeah. that we're in. So. Uh, so your do I understand you correctly, Larry? Your proposal is that staff come back with additional scenarios for six and seven year phasing? Yeah, and with, whether we are in a position to use some of our retained capital to do that. So these are non-reserve funds. So I'm not, I'm not asking staff to come back with a proposal to go into our reserves, but we do have retained earnings which accumulate year to year, in part from the debt coverage ratio requirement that we're stuck with when we do these bonding bond deals. Just, just to be clear about the debt service coverage ratio, it requires our revenues to exceed our operating expenditures, not our total expenditures. Right. And so uh, excesses there can be used for things like capital projects. They just can't be spent on operating. So it's not necessarily, sometimes it is, uh, excess funds from year to year, but sometimes they're programmed to be spent for things like debt or other capital expenditures. So it's not always just a surplus, it's a surplus of operating expenditures, but not over total. And I'm assuming you budget anticipating some degree of that surplus being available to pay operating expenses and other costs as we go through this. So it's not just piling up. Um, if, if I may just get a bit of clarification, Director Bragman, in, in terms of the request, um, is if, if I understand um, the request, it doesn't necessarily preclude the consideration at this meeting in regards to the staff recommendation of the five-year ramp-up. It would be potentially following that consideration and direction to staff, looking at additional alternatives perhaps for consideration. Correct. Perfect. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Not, not to the exclusion of the staff recommendation. And I'm, I think I'm a little confused by that because don't you have on the next page the tenure phasing? So you've got your bookends. I'm not sure what's gained by having staff spend more time on determining between the five-year and the ten-year. I mean, we, we, we've got those bookends. You've got no phasing five-year, ten-year, so what, what, are, I, what are you hoping to accomplish with more analysis of a six- and a seven-year phase-in? I mean, we can pretty much see the numbers. Are not, they're not the same scenarios. So what I'm basing my request on is the unrestricted, undesignated funds as that were presented that have gone up. So if we use some of those funds for this capital improvement uh, budget, we could delay the debt, um, or it would essentially help, you know, fund that program um, instead of just relying on this new CIP and then incurring that additional debt. In other words, using some of the retained capital and just funneling it towards these projects. I think Charlie's going to respond. 
Well, just, uh, I think ultimately what you're talking about is a difference between the five-year phasing for a 5 8 centimeter would be $5.45. Right. The 10-year phasing would be $2.73. Right. This is the monthly cost of um, the CMF. So you would fall somewhere in between if you went six years or seven years because as uh, Director Kohler said, it, those are your bookends of what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is using retained capital instead of debt. So we would use some retained capital so, to fund this. So okay. Staff can take a look at this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so I think one of the objectives of this meeting had been to direct staff about this. So it sounds like we're not, well, at least um, Director Bragman, it sounds like you're not prepared to do that today. I'm not sure that we have consensus on that. Um, well, I'm hearing that's pretty necessary. I, um, my understanding is that um, well, we have a few more items and we'll come to the staff recommendation. My understanding, not to um, speak for yourself, but in, what, what I understand is let's proceed with the discussion today let's consider staff's recommendations. I actually don't hear opposition from that from Director Bragman, um, recognizing that the final adoption of the ordinance is not until the end of May. We can continue to look at potential options and flexibilities to lessen the impact. Yeah, that's fine. I want to make sure, Larry Russell, we hear from you because I, I thought I heard you say something else. So I think you're getting a few different recommendations from the board. Uh, I'm a little confused, very frankly. Um, I mean, my position, I think, is clear in that, you know, I, I don't see the value of the debt. Um, but as I said, my ears are open. You know, I'm, I'm here to, to hear and listen and, you know, move forward. Okay. I don't have anything in particular about five or ten years, you know, for me, the zero years is okay. So, yeah. you know, that's where I'm coming from. Okay, so just to clarify for purposes of our minutes and to make sure we're all on the same page, when you say, okay, so you, when you, you say you don't have a, a particular position on the phasing, you said on the debt, I just want to make sure that we're hearing you correctly, Larry. I think you are. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, okay, okay. my uh, engineering judgment is that we should not incur more debt at this point in time. So your position for purposes of today is that you're open-minded, but your position today is that you would go with the no phasing option? Yes. Okay, got it. All right, um, so I think you have your bookends. Yeah, I, I would actually go almost 100% what Larry, Larry Russell just said. Uh, however, I'm very sensitive to staff's recommendation, and I certainly can live with that. Yeah. Um, what, what I would suggest I guess we could do it either way. I was envisioning we get through discussions and not recommendations and review these issues and then we'd get to staff's collective recommendations on all these items and see where the board would like to go with that. Okay, I'm just trying to deal with them as we go through them because they're each complicated in their own right. We can revisit them at the end of the, when we get through them all. Um, so with that, I think it's time to move on to um, and I, we are going to have time for public comment. My preference is to go through all four issues before we get there. So that's how we're going to do things today. Um, so um, we're going to go on now to option uh, to B, options for collecting the capital maintenance fee. So we've broken out three uh, collection options. Uh, one is the property tax uh, that's been discussed in, in the past. It does have the advantage of focusing uh, the CMF on the property owner because these long-term infrastructure investments are uh, in large part supporting uh, property values, good clean water. Um, I heard a story this morning about uh, Legionnaires and uh, the issues that are coming from that here in the United States. Uh, Bi-monthly bill, uh, it would smooth our cash flow uh, and uh, our ratepayers are familiar with getting that bill six times a year, uh, a hybrid approach that combines the two. And so any questions about transparency in the CMF uh, would be um, smoothed out by putting the CMF on the bi-monthly bill for two years and then having it transition to the property tax bill uh, after, after that two-year period. 
with respond with well, regard. Hang up, hang up. I just want to pause. <laughs> Does the board have a kind of have anything they want to discuss here at this point on the uh, the collection options? Larry Russell, do you have anything that you want to discuss here on the on the options for collection? Uh -oh. well, okay. well, thank you for asking. Um, sure. The only thing I would like to say is that I think there's room for a fourth option, which we've discussed, which is that it is up to the user whether they want it on the property tax bill or on their monthly bill or bi-monthly bill. I, I think that's a fair one to throw in. I, I think all of these have um, interesting uh, aspects of them. Uh, and, you know, uh, you, we could try it one way, the hybrid approach, and if no one's complaining about it on the bill, we just leave it on the bill, or we put it on the property tax bill and treat it like the fire flow fund and just move forward. Uh, you know, I have said this before, I, we have property in East Bay Mud territory, and their bill has like seven of these kinds of uh, funds on each bi-monthly bill, and then they have them on the property tax bill too. So, you know, they've got a blend of both and, you know, it seems to work fine. Um, assuming the, the state and local taxes are reestablished in future Congresses, um, the deduction, then obviously it's better for most folks to have it on the property tax bill than it is to have it on the, the monthly bill or by monthly bill. Okay. I think that brings us to C, the, uh, the fee adjustment for um, non-consumption purposes. So the factors that determine meter size for consumption purposes, we would look at the size of the house, namely the amount of fixtures that they have. If they have three bathrooms or four bathrooms, their fixture number would go up, and that would dictate what size meter they should have to serve the property. For non-consumption purposes, we have sprinkler systems or inadequate water pressure. So, but for those two reasons, they would have a smaller meter size, say a three-quarter inch instead of a one-inch meter, uh, but their sprinkler system requires them to upsize, but they're never really going to go there because the number of fixtures that they have and just the typical. Um, one key point to, sh uh, to point out is the applicant requests the meter, their architect or their engineer would state what size meter they need to, to not have pressure issues either for their sprinkler system or their, or their showers and things. And so they tell us what they're requesting. We do not dictate to the, to the property owner. It's, it's usually fire, the fire marshal or the building official. Yes, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty typical. However, we are looking at, and, and we'll, we'll jump into that, the uh, National Fire Protection Association back in 1998, uh, 1998 started putting in the fire codes recommendations for sprinklers for single family residential homes. And uh, that has been adopted by local jurisdictions and the California Fire Code in 2010 added it to the statewide requirements. And so for a new house, it's a requirement for old, older house homes. Uh, once you get to the point where you're renovating it more than 50%, then it triggers compliance with the building and fire codes and having to put in a sprinkler. We've uh, looked at and we've come up with about 3,500 single family residences that we've identified that have sp uh, fire sprinklers. That's about 6% of our overall single family home residences. Uh, that we believe have upsized meters solely due to fire sprinklers. So we're proposing a process by way of looking at what, if they came in, if they weren't required to have sprinklers, uh, what would the meter size be? So that would be fixture count would, would dictate that. And if they can show us that uh, through their fixture count, they qualify for a one inch meter, but because of fire reasons, uh, a one and a half meter or because of severe pressure issues because <coughs> they have a high altitude uh, piece of property, uh, we would look at reducing their size one meter size for the CMF. We believe that is um, appropriate and uh, allows for us to take into consideration that 
this is not really for consumption purposes. They were only upsized because of non-consumption reasons. This chart shows you the proposed CMF charge for the meter size in the first column. The adjusted CMF would be the next size down. Uh, the next column shows the difference between the two, and then the column to the far right is the potential numbers of meters upsized. Uh, but in our research, we found uh, some houses that would have that size meter even if they didn't have the sprinkler system just because of the number of bathrooms and fixtures and things like that. So the total revenue impact would be about a half a million dollars if all of them qualified. Uh, and seems unlikely. Seems unlikely, but uh, okay. what's being proposed is a process by way of allowing people to come in and, uh, and see if they would qualify. Make application for the Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's it for that section. So I've got a quick uh, point. Um, so I appreciate that in the slide you make the point about how many you know, folks would be affected and the 6%. It's not in the, um, the staff report, and I'd like to request whenever this item comes up that we include that number because there seems to be, at least in correspondence that I've received, substantial confusion about that for, I'm certain, a large number of reasons, including some misinformation circulating in the public. So if we could be quite, quite clear about in all of our communications on this issue about both the number of meters at issue and the fact that it is represents as you said Charlie roughly six percent I think it's great that it's in the slides but you know to the point that was made earlier this is the document that's available online so I just really want to emphasize how important that is for combating the misinformation out there on this issue okay we'll make that happen um, I, I will just say that on this item I think the process looks like it looks you know based on the folks who come to testify and the questions that have been directed to me um, on email this seems like a very <coughs> reasonable approach I don't know if other board members have any views on this at this point I do too and well, it, it goes to the whole point of, of basing the fee on the capacity um, uh, that each service requires of the system. So if it's really not for consumption purposes, then it's really not stressing the capacity and it should be adjusted. So I think it's good that you guys have come up with this. And I think the non-consumption description is a good good description so that folks understand you know the purpose. And then Larry Russell you had something? Yeah, yeah a couple of things. Uh, I think it, it, it's better to say the potential demand here because that's really what we're seeing is you could have that demand not that you would have that demand because of meter size but it's also important to understand that the fixture count is a the way it's actually used in the plumbing code is a statistical evaluation there's a device called hunter's curve hunter was a statistician for the bureau of uh, balance or something to that effect the ones that do weights and measures and he invented this or realized that people don't the larger the house doesn't mean you keep using more water so just keep in mind it's not a linear curve it, it's, it's shaped like a parabola it curves over so um, it, it's not usually used in small facilities like a house it's usually more for a building with you know say 500 units as opposed to a single family house so be a little careful, I think, in relying on that because I think you're getting in kind of the fuzzy end of the hunter's curve to make a decision if, if they, they need this or that size meter or this size meter. So just keep that in mind. Okay, thanks, Larry. Um, so any further board comment on C? If not, then we should let, um, we should let Charlie go on to D, non-ratepayer funded programs, or as I like to think of it, the Super Saver program, primarily. I guess there's more than one. Yes, uh, okay. we'll, we'll tackle Super Water Saver right after we talk about the waiver program for low-income residents. Right. Right. So currently the waiver program, uh, the service charge waiver program for low-income accounts waives the meter ch uh, service charge and the watershed fee on the bi-monthly bill, those two fees, um, for anyone that can demonstrate who applies to us and demonstrates that they're 
at or below 60% of the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development HUD low income designation of, right now it's $117,000 a year for a family of four in Marin. Uh, what the proposal... Can you say that, that number again? Because that's another thing that's been circulating with different numbers and it's something else we should be very clear about in all of our paper on this. So. What's that number again? Uh, $117,000 a year for a family of four is the low income level designated by HUD. Okay, thanks. For so Marin that, County. And is that the number that Marin County itself also uses for these kinds of determinations? Uh, that I don't, well, if they're using the HUD guidelines, it is, because okay. that's the, the federal standard. Okay, got it. And so, uh, a few years ago, the board moved the percentage up to 60% of that number. Uh, currently, we're looking at uh, raising it to 80%. Uh, one of the unknowns is that we have to use rate, non-ratepayer funds for this. So we are looking at seeing if we could cap it right now at $300,000 so that we don't have an unexpected budget hit. But of course, if it came close to $300,000, we'd come back and report to the board and let you know the standard, uh, the status of this, and see if there are any adjustments we want to make at that time. Okay, Charlie, do you know what the um, if you have a, a number for folks who are currently in that category, what their average bi-monthly, uh, you know, what they're paying on average on a bi-monthly basis? Uh, what they're paying for our water bill? Right. Um, I'd have to check to okay. see what their consumption is because they are charged the normal tiered rates. Right. Um, it's just those two fixed charges that are waived. Um, but I can see if I can find right. that. Right. I think that would be a, a useful thing. My my guess is that just you know, all things being equal, and just based on my experience with other utilities in other parts of the country, that um, people in a lower income bracket tend to be also low water users. But I think it's worth ground truthing here. Good. We'll take a look at that. Okay. So what happens if we hit 300000 Right now what I've envisioned is uh, starting a waiting list um, to look at it. Well, f first we would um, come back to the board <coughs> and we would review our current um, cash status and bring you alternatives that would include, based on the demand, can we increase that 300000 um, or would we recommend um, holding off until the next budget cycle and plan for the demand? So the board would be fully apprised of where we stand in terms of the uptake based on this increase in percentage and make decisions accordingly. Okay. I guess it's going to be uh, I have it's a an comment. uncertain thing. So. Okay. Okay, Larry Russell. Okay. Um, one thing I'd like to see, Charlie, is a projection into the future of the growth of these amounts. For instance, I recall that the 100 marks per landing has an escalator built into it on the rental uh, for that land. So, you know, there's a way of looking to the future. The, the leases on the antennas and stuff might be a little more complicated to figure out but we could at least have a plan for where we're going so we could see that in the future. I, I think this is a really important program. And, you know, it, it's bothered me a little bit to be subjective on the, uh, the lower, the income level. You know, why, why aren't we at 100% instead of at 80 or 65 or whatever number we're at or going to be at? And, you know, I think we should strive to get to that 114,000 as our goal if we can. And like I say, that'll help us kind of look into the future on that area. I, I just wanted to clarify that um, our lease revenue, the non-rate revenue is not constraining the $300,000. Um, we have far more revenue, non-rate revenue than that. The reasoning behind putting a cap is um, we did not develop the budget anticipating this. This came from the board in consideration of this rate increase and in ways to uh, dampen the impact, particularly for low-income residents. So um, going forward, it's really more of a budgeting issue than anything else, um, just for the <coughs> clarification. So the 300000 is is a short-term 
issue, as you're saying. Okay. Yeah. And it could be adjusted. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, the other point I'd, I'd like to make here, make here, and this this is really for another day, but it seems the right place to raise it. Um, California has, I think, correctly adopted a statute establishing a human right to water, and to me that has begged the issue for some time about whether water districts, and especially one like ours, um, should be considering a base level of water that is simply provided as a matter of a human right. And um, I, I don't believe that we can consider it at this time, but I think this is, you know, we are, we are certainly not going to have, this is not going to be our only um, consideration about how to deal with, um, with these issues. We will be back talking about, you know, rates and, um, you know, and um, how to pay for water um, without, without ceasing. So um, I want to make sure to, to bookmark that. I think um, we have a strong, state um, foundation for considering um, a situation where some base level of water is simply provided as a matter of right. And um, so I'd like to make sure that we consider that very soon. So I have a comment. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, I just want to say I completely support your position, Cynthia. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I, I'd second that. And yeah. the other thing is just to bounce off that is at some point in the next few years, we're going to have to do another cost of service analysis. So I think at that point, we can really start digging into some of these issues, you know, as far as are we going to weight consumption more versus fixed charge? How do we work that human right kind of approach to water into a cost of service analysis so we don't run afoul of Prop 218? So that remains to be seen too in, in the new COSA. Right, and it is an interesting question how Prop 218 and the human right to water interact. I have not, to my knowledge, a court has not addressed that. So it would be an interesting thing for us to take on. I'm not sure I'm in the camp that, that uh, accepts that Prop 218 is the last word on all these issues in light of other um, equally um, critical legal mandates that the state has established. But, but yes, that would be that would be the challenge, would be reconciling those things to the best of our ability. Um, so I think with that, are we, do you want to move on then one, to this? One thing I want to just, can we make a specific note to bring that human right to water, human right to water uh, policy back to the board as an agenda item as soon as the dust settles on all this other stuff? Yes, we'll do that. Thank you, Jack. I really appreciate that support. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then, do you want to, we're moving on to the super saver. I'm uh, ready if you are. Uh, we are, we're ready. So the super water saver credit program is built around taking about 5%, which is uh, roughly we're looking at 3,000 of our water conserving single family residential customers and granting them an $8 credit on their bill. And so this will be dynamic. It'll be measured every month, looking back for the last 12 months. So it could change uh, from a month-to-month -month basis, whether someone's in or, or not. Uh, we have projected the cost to be about $155,000. Uh, again, this would be non-ratepayer funds uh, funding this program. Right. I love this program. I think this is a great idea and a good thing for us to be doing. I think it sends a strong message that even though we need to be fully collecting our fixed costs that we are nevertheless committed to efficiency and to using um, you know our price signal and um, the tools that are that are available to us to uh, to reward customers who are responding to that message so um, any other board comment on this item at this time okay Larry Russell comment on this item I, I just support it completely I agree with you and um, I think we should do everything. One could make a direct correlation between this and the right to water. You can, it, it, yeah. It's, it's exactly. I agree. It's just that that only represents a small number of our folks. But anyway, but yes, they, they, I think it is a, definitely a step in the right direction and a good, a good foundation. Okay, that brings us to the recommendations portion of this agenda item. So, based on the presentation, the recommendations, as I noted, were developed in consideration of the board's expressed interest to look at um, alternative ways um, to address this impact of moving from 
100 percent debt funding to cash funding with the CMF we um, staff recommends I recommend the following the first item is to direct staff mm -hmm. to include in the draft rate ordinance and of course the draft rate ordinance will be brought to the board currently scheduled on May 28th for the um, uh, rate hearing a five-year ramp up for the CMF utilizing 28.6 million dollars in bond funding to fill in the capital revenue gap for the CIP to continue to keep the CIP as described in whole the second recommendation is to direct staff to include in the draft rate ordinance billing the CMF bi-monthly on the water bill for the first two years for the reasons as described in the presentation and then similarly subsequently on an annual basis on the property tax statement for the reasons discussed in the presentation the third recommendation is to direct staff to include in the draft rate ordinance the adjustment process is described in the presentation for the CMF for residential meters that have been upsized for non-consumption reasons and lastly to include in the draft rate ordinance an enhancement to the service charge waiver program for low-income residents changing the eligibility percentage from the current 60 percent to 80 percent and implementation of the proposed super water saver program okay i'm going to propose that we take these in reverse order just because it seems like we've got a lot of consensus on some of the later items so starting with the uh the super saver um program um and the service charge waiver which are kind of put together i think we're going to have the board discussion and then we're going to go to public comment um no no we're not going to a motion there's no motion here this is all staff recommendation i just want to make sure we've got I want to make sure we have staff we have the opportunity for the board to discuss to respond to all of these recommendations and then we'll go to, to a comment is that okay mm -hmm. okay so and if we we don't have to have consensus I'm just checking to see where we do to make it easy um, so I'm item four, the one that Ben just finished on the uh, well let's just take them one at a time on the service charge waiver for low-income residents you know that's something I feel very comfortable supporting the staff recommendation so I'm just I just want to do a kind of a quick check-in with the board I, I heard consensus on that Correct. Yeah. Larry Russell? Yes. Okay, great. Same for the Super Saver? Correct. Yes. Great. One asterisk on four is um, I'd like to see what PG&E is doing on their, on their low income, what their eligibility criteria is. That's just informational, though. I do support the, the proposal. Great. Um, and then moving to three, um, I, I, heard a lot of, uh, I heard a lot of alignment on the, um, the adjustment process for the CMF. So I just want to check in. I'm on board with the process that staff has proposed with the recommendation. Board members? Yes. Larry Russell? You mean, you mean two? Two you're talking about? Nope, right? I'm talking about three. Oh, the draft three. rate ordinance adjustment process to the CMF. For residential customers that yes, have been upsized? Yes, yes, yes. That's fine. Yeah, I'm cool. Yeah, cool. Okay, great. Yes. All right. Um, so now to get to the trickier ones. Um, the uh the options for collecting the cmf um as i understand it staff's recommendation is to go by monthly for two years and then move to the property tax so board discussion on this item i'm, I'm comfortable with the staff recommendation but i am i am open if there are um concerns or, or other other approaches so i just want to do a quick check-in with the board on this proposal this recommendation i should say by staff i'm comfortable i'm comfortable i recommendation I, I don't think we should commit right now to migrating it to property tax, but I'm comfortable having the option in two years, seeing how it goes. I think I'm seeing Mary shake her head. Um, Mary and I have talked about this, and um, the ordinance, because um, different people, property owners versus tenants, may receive the bill, does need to be clear on this item. Of course, it does not preclude the board in two years time prior to moving it to property tax to reconsider the item and go through an ordinance change. Larry Russell, on number two, the 
Staff cool. recommendation? Cool, I'm taking cool as yes. yes. I'm, okay. fine. I'm fine. That's bringing, <laughs> that is, brings us to the, converse, to the first option. And I think we've had a lot of board discussion. I'm happy to have more, but um, is there anything else that, that um, I'm comfortable with personally, again, just going on record with the staff recommendation as far as um, phasing in of the CMF. But I just want to check in with board because we had a discussion beforehand. I think it would be helpful to hear where the board is before we, at this point, before we go to staff comment. I mean, sorry, to public comment. I'm comfortable with it. With the staff recommendation. I'd like to see additional information um, as discussed about using retained earnings okay. to spread it out a little further. Okay. And then Larry Russell, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I heard you being more comfortable with the, uh, with the non-phasing option. That's correct. Okay. But what you said. Okay. So that is where we are right now with these four recommendations. I would like to now open it up to public comment on um, all four elements of this agenda item. Is there any public comment on this item? Yeah. On all of them? Yeah. It's one agenda item. Oh, well, okay. On all first. Okay. <laughs> and given that this was a large item, I am happy to, um, um, at my personal discretion, allow people to take more than the three minutes. Okay. Um, Ann Thomas, for Puerto Madeira. I am speaking for myself, not any organization. Uh, is this and I need to ask you, yeah, to speak into the microphone. Is it not on? Is it is it working? There you go. Oh, you just need to get you need to get very close. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, Ann Thomas, Corte Madeira, speaking uh, for myself. I think you've made something simple, very complicated, um, and I <coughs> barely understand what you're doing. Um, regarding the um, well, the, the 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 options for phasing in, I would. I think that your original recommendation for non-phasing is just fine. Um, you're not, the public is not safe. Larry, the public is not saving money by spreading it all around, you know, different years and a little debt this year and a little non-debt next year. The public, you pay Peter or you pay Paul, that's it. And you might as well just pay up front and be done with it. Um, I am a little confused what you, what your recommendation on this number two is, the bi-monthly two year, does that mean that someone who is a tenant would get it on a prop, on a water bill and then it would go on the, and then and then that would stop after two years? I think what it means, and well I should let staff respond, but I'm just gonna jump in just to make sure I understand it. Different landlords and tenants have different agreements about water. Sometimes tenants pay, sometimes landlords pay. Yeah. So the idea is that it would go on the water bill, whoever paid it for two years, and would then shift to the property tax bills really as a way of um, you know, giving the public an opportunity to become uh, conscious and uh, be aware. So does staff want to jump in with a further explanation? Okay, I think I passed the test. Well, I think that's nutty. I mean, I don't okay. think that, I, I don't, people aren't going to like get together. People aren't, are just going to get the bill and say, oh my God. Look, I do not think tenants should be paying this. I think that um, when someone is renting, they pay rent and that is how they pay for all of the amenities, whether it's a view from the deck or, you know, the improvements that were made to the fire department or the water system. Um, and those are the respon those should be the financial responsibility solely of the property owner and it is I, I just don't think it's fair and I am a landlord and I am not a tenant I'm a landlord and I do think that those things are my responsibility so anyway uh, I think that was my well, and I do have a little comment on the uh, the super saver which I guess you all sort of loved the only problem with the super saver is a super saver, maybe someone who just travels in business all week, comes home, takes a shower on Sunday, and is not really a super saver, just <laughs> coincidentally happens to hardly use any water. So, I mean, instead of a family of four that is really religiously reusing the dishwater on the house plants kind of thing. So, anyway, but I guess you will do what you do, but I hope you do get on with it. This process has been way too clumsy. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Any other comments on this agenda item? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll again for cost. 
you gave us an awful lot of information today without any preview of it before the meeting, which I reiterate again <clears throat> is a real concern. Uh, that said, here's what I think I heard, what I think I can comment on, but it's going to be superficial at this point. Um, you had a table that showed the uh, debt coverage ratios going up from 1.51 to 3.57 in 10 years, if you, if, that's, if I understood it without any phase in. In other words, the base case, if I understood that correctly. Well, that's way above what your covenants require, so that indicates you have a lot of room for debt. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, let's remember that customers benefit in lower annual payments if you borrow money for 30 years for a project than if you charge them for the full cost year by year as you would spend the money for a 10-year capital investment over 10 years. I'd much rather pay over 30 than 10. And there's also intergenerational <clears throat> considerations that come to play here. Now, um, Ms. Thomas, I think that's her name, pardon me? Yes. yes. Mentioned about interest. Interest is a price that borrows, borrowers pay lenders for the privilege of keeping the lender's money for a long, long period of time paying it back in cheaper dollars in the future. So a dollar of interest that I pay 30 years from now is much less costly to me if I pay it than the dollar I would have to pay today. Inflation, unfortunately, has not been outruled in the world we live in. So the dollars you pay over time should be discounted if you want to get apples and apples. And that's the way I would want to pay for these long-term capital investments, not in 10 years, for equipment that's going to live 50 to 100 years by your own definition. Spread it out, go to the debt markets, borrow the money, and we'll pay it over a long period of time with cheaper annual amounts, debt plus interest. Okay, that's one. I think the question came up about rental property. I'm unclear. Uh, and I think now I'm even more confused, where renters stand under the proposal. Both the basic proposal that did not have the bi-monthly bill, but instead would just have it against the property owner's requirement. I've rented before, and I paid utilities. My landlord didn't pay my electricity, my gas, or my water. And that probably cuts on both sides of that. So I, I asked for clarification. It sounds like we're not going to get it for two years if you go with the, the staff recommendation. Uh, the issue of upside meters, like many of the issues in this proposal, would not be an issue if you collected the money on a usage basis alone, instead of doing it on an annual basis for the meter size. I tried to explain this before, maybe not very clearly. You've got $16.5 million for the first year. You've got 10 million CCFs of consumption. Divide 10 and 16.5, you get $1.65. Charge $1.65 for every CCF that is consumed by every customer. You don't have to go through all this questionable allocation or challengeable unfair charges. The one, let's look at the one-inch meter. The one-inch meter average is 30 CCF per two years. The 5 eighths is 17. So the one-inch average uses 80% more than the 5 eighths inch uh, user. That's 1.85 is 30 over 17. But you're charging them, what, $409 versus 163. That's 150% of what you're charging the 5 8 inch meter. So again, charge them all on the consumption of CCF, not on the size of the meter. It would be much fairer. I also might mention, as I just saw this, North Marin Water is raising its rates. Uh, it was in the paper, uh, I think, two days ago. They included in a chart to support their rate increases what the service charges are and what the fixed 
charges are for 20 different Bay Area utilities. If you go ahead and charge your uh, C, C, CMF as a fixed fee, un, independent of usage, your fixed fee will be the largest of any in the Bay Area. So again, go on the usage basis. Don't do it on this fixed um, meter size requirement. I think that's all I have because <laughs> you really hit us cold with an awful lot of data today. I guess I commend you for that. <clears throat> and I presume and hope we'll have a chance to review and comment on this further between now and the 28th of May. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments on this item? Larry Minnick, San Rafael. Um, I'm in agreement with Director Russell. Uh, don't take on any other debt. Um, we're, we're, we're in a, with climate change and with the possibility of earthquakes coming, because every year all the statistics say within the next 15 years something's going to let go. You need to be prepared, and you need to have as much reserve there as possible. Um, take the IJ today, for example, their, their opinion. And if you look at the comments, you've got six comments, six comments. Four of them were, or three of them were, I think, were from uh, cost-based people, all right? Two of them had nothing to really do with this. So there's not this overwhelming uh, surge. We'll see tonight at the Mill Valley meeting. You know, you get 1,500 people who, go, who may complain about it. But overall, I think people are just, yeah, utilities, yeah, you got to raise rates, yeah. You know, we've been, we're in a mentality, and we, we've been this mentality for decades here, where we've been subsidizing water rates, basically. People have been getting water below retail. They've been getting it wholesale. And what I mean by that is that we've got this infrastructure. And the, as I've said before, the people from the 20s through the 70s, they're the ones that paid for the current infrastructure. The people, us going forward, we really didn't pay for We We got it all for free. And had we charged retail for a number of years here, and what I mean by that is if we had looked forward and we added a few cents to the cost of water each time, I don't think we'd be having this discussion today at all because I think we'd be in a much better financial shape. And what I'm afraid of is that with this phase and we're looking at the same sort of mentality where we're trying to take, quote unquote, the pain away from the rate payer, when really there really is, it's a perception, there really is not pain here. You know, $14 or $34 a month is, you know, $34, excuse me, for one inch, is, is nothing, it, it, it's, it, it's not gonna hit as hard. You know, we're gonna see other fees come in that are going to be far more expensive. You know, we're gonna see PG&E, for example. And we're all owners in this, and we're all invested in this. And I'm going to come back to that entire thing about insurance rates and how this will impact people positively by taking care of our infrastructure. Because we know that the insurance companies and the insurance industry is going to be looking at this. And they're very skittish. And we'll probably have more fires. We'll probably, unfortunately, lose more houses in California this summer. And the issue is just going to come to the surface, and I think that's going to become one of the most critical points of this. And so the more that we do in terms of resiliency, in terms of infrastructure resiliency, the better it is for ratepayers. In the, that this is really our investment in this county, you know, and that's that's what I think is important here. So my suggestion on this is collect that fee, just stand firm. I mean, show that you're committed. You know, you put it out there, and by going and talking about phase, and I think you're just, as you've done in here, and, and, and we're compared to the average citizen, we're fairly informed in this room, and everyone's confused by all of this. And just, just narrow it down, simplify it for everyone. Go with what you're proposing in the 218. Just go with it, please. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, any other comments on this agenda item? I see you, Priscilla. <laughs> You already told everybody my name, but I live in Kentfield. Um, 
I was so reassured to hear Larry Russell say he was confused. <laughs> he's really deep into all this stuff, and I am not. And so um, it just underlines this is really a lot to try to understand. And I probably don't agree with you on much, but I certainly do agree that it would be nice to get all these charts and graphs in the packet ahead of time. I mean, it's so almost unbelievable that they're not there. So, um, okay, get on to the subject matter here. Um, the smoothing attempts just seem absurd. You get, people will get used to something for a couple of years and all of a sudden it changes. When your notice goes out with one bit of information in it and then it changes. I mean, if you want to do it, if you need to do it based on your cost of service analysis, just do it or attempt to do it if you can get enough good, in, good, clear information out to the public, I think they'll be satisfied. So um, when you talk about the meter size and the breaks for people who have sprinkler system, first of all, nothing that I've seen, not that I've looked at everything, but the, the jumps, the numbers that goes up from a 5 8 to a 1 inch. I never saw any thing they were based on, and I assumed they were based on your COSA study, but maybe not. But if the COSA study justified it, then isn't that what you need to do under Prop 218? That was my understanding. That's uh, actually a question. But then when you're also considering the impact onto the property owner because they have a sprinkler system, I think, which of course is mandated and that wasn't your responsibility, but the fire code and frankly, it, you know, I would love to have a sprinkler system now we know about fires and I would think it would add some value, first of all, in my insurance rates and secondly, because I'm up in the hills and uh, secondly on uh, maybe even, I don't know, the real estate industry would know whether that is a benefit when you're selling your house that you have a sprinkler system and your buyers are happy and willing to pay a little extra for it. So I think that those fire safety requirements are a benefit to the homeowners and you're acting as though it's a burden and that they should pay a few, you know, 10, 20, 40 cents less on water because <coughs> of a requirement by a different jurisdiction. So um, that, um, okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Stick with your original thing. You made a really good argument in favor of going, um, what do you call it, pay as you go. Mm -hmm. And then when you list some of the, what you know I'm interested in spending the money on, including the condition of the watershed. So to have it go to uh, in, uh, rates to some lender that doesn't sound appealing. Thank you. Thanks. Can I, I don't know if there's any more public comment. If there is, we'll get to it. But I do want to answer Priscilla's question, if you can, Shirley. It seems like an important one. I think people need to hear about this. Her, and Priscilla, tell me if I've got this right. This, there's basically a jump, right, from the 5 eighths meter to the 1 eighths meter. And she's asking, was that just arbitrary or was that based on the COSA? Have I got your question correct? Yes. OK. Uh, yes, that is based on the COSA, which is based on the industry standards of a 5 eighths inch meter, I think is about 20 gallons per minute, uh, going up from a 3 quarters inch to a 1 inch. Uh, a 1 inch can have two and a half times the water flow through it, a one inch meter, versus a five eighths inch meter. And so that's how they have the capacity ratios created, and that's how the dollar figures run exactly along those lines of how much water comes through, and that's a reflection of the potential burden on the system of having to go uh, to supply all the water that could go through that meter. We take into consideration the non-consumption based mm -hmm. aspects to try to even that out some because we think it's appropriate but that's how those numbers come along. Okay. 
Does that answer your question, or do you have another related follow-up? No, that answers my question. It just emphasizes that it was based on something. Yes. You're, I know you've been trying to carefully follow to the requirements of two. Yes. And that. So it comes right out of the COSA is really kind of the bottom line. Yeah, but it, there's no reason to vary from yeah. that. If, if that's your legal mandate under 218. Right, right, exactly. Okay, any other public comment on this agenda item? I come back. <laughs> yeah. This will be your fourth bite of the apple. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> but we're delighted to have you, yeah, thank um, you. make them. Um, on the last <laughs> topic, <clears throat> the basic assumption you're using is that you've designed your system to meet the requirements of uh, all your customers if they all at the same time took all the water they could get through all of their different meters. I mean, that's underpinning the basis for your determining uh, what the CMF would be per meter. Uh, and, and then the corollary to that is that <clears throat> you've assumed that you must meet that requirement somehow. And in order to meet that requirement somehow, you must further assume that you've designed your whole system for the impossible, coincidental, maximum usage that all customers could get if they opened up all their meters and took all the water, uh, opened up all their appliances and took all the water that they could. That's why, again, I keep saying, do it on a usage basis. It's non-discriminatory, it's not arbitrary, and it's defensible. The one-inch customer that uses 100 C CF would pay the same amount for that amount of water as does the half inch. And you'll get it at $1.65 per CCF. Your cost allocation winds up, now that you've given me the real numbers of your throughput, $1.61 is what the average usage per CCF would cost under your methodology at 5 eighths. Now at one inch, however, it's more like $2.25. The one inch people are getting discriminated against by your methodology. And you could correct this and be fair, and you wouldn't have to do all of this upsize meter correction stuff if you did it as you should and fairly could by having a one charge per CCF. I don't understand why you wouldn't do that. Thank you. Um, ben, do you want to respond to this notion that our Use of the system is designed with this assumption about everybody using as much water as they possibly could at one moment? Um, yes, I did want to note that um, aside from sprinkler requirements and pressure issues, customers have a choice on the size of their meter. Um, if a customer has an inch and a half meter, um, outside of fire sprinklers or pressure issues that we're trying to address, they have the means and ability to go through a process to downsize that meter if they so choose and if their usage or potential usage is not reflective of that larger size meter. So this does have a way of addressing many of the issues I've heard. The um, sizing of the system, the infrastructure, the water supply, the dams, the pipes, the pumps, um, take into account many, many factors, including actual demand and potential demand on the system. Okay. Are there any other public comments on this item? All right. Um, it's been a lively debate. I think it's informed where we are. I want to bring this back to the board. Is there any other further board comment on this item, or have we provided um, direction to um, Ben and his team that we can for today. And I'm going to start with Larry on the phone. Uh, I'm fine where we are. Okay. I'm fine. Just a comment, just for the public. I, I think all of us on the board and hopefully the public, there is consensus that there's a need to fund infrastructure. So I think and this is to Larry Minicus's comment, I think the commitment to meet those requirements is felt by all of us. It's really just a question of how do we do it? How do we fund it? So 
I just kind of want to make that distinction so as we move forward. Okay. Um, I think I'm fine with where we are, and I think my last comment to the public, and I, Larry, this is a response to you as well, see how influential you are. Um, why is everybody named Larry? That's really my question for <laughs> everybody. Everybody used to be named Bob, and now everybody's named Larry. Um, uh, Just a good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, more Cynthia's, that's what I say. No, um, so some of the comments have taken a, have suggested that this is something radical and new and that somehow we've been ignoring infrastructure all this time. And I just have to say, I, I fundamentally disagree with that. I and mean, in my 14 years on the board, every single rate increase has been about this same exact issue. So I would um, posit that um, during the time that I have been here at least, we have consistently addressed these issues. Maybe not exactly the way everybody would like, maybe some people would have liked us to do more and others less, but this is not new. We have not suddenly woken up and said, <coughs> oh my goodness, we need to fund infrastructure. It is what we do, it is what we have always done. It is what we do at every single meeting that I attend, which is pretty much all of them. So um, I think this is simply an attempt by the board and the staff to, um, you know, just given where we are today, to take another run that we haven't before about how to fund these things. But I think it's very important for the public to appreciate and to hear clearly that this district has been funding infrastructure along and along and along and along. As I said earlier, there is no peace dividend. We will need to continue to fund infrastructure. So this is not some radical turn. We are continuing the work that we have done for, again, I can only speak for the years that I've been on the board, but since I've been on the board, to fund these fundamental basic assumptions. I'm not sure why there's this narrative out there that this is that we've somehow woken from a deep sleep. That's just nonsense, and I would appreciate if everybody would stop saying it. Um, what we are doing here that is different is considering a new way of funding these things and trying to balance a lot of competing fairly, you know, all of which are legitimate, legitimate concerns. What is not different in my mind is, is the basic goal, which is continuing to maintain the fiscal health of the organization while we continue to do as we have been doing um, and continuing to fund our capital needs. So I'm hoping that we on the board all agree with that. Great. Yes, Anne. Okay, I, I, I don't think we have been complaining about that. Can Some people have definitely been complaining about that. Okay. Can you see that all these things that you show in these meetings get on the website because, yes, I mean, it's good information. Yes, I appreciate that, and I believe the board has been consistent in requesting that staff provide all of these, um, all of these things to be on the website. It seems like the public is still having trouble finding them, so maybe we can have a conversation about what it is that is challenging. Because I think after every single meeting, we say the same thing: let's have these presentations available on the website. Well, staff has come up with a way with the nature of a, the website to have a, it's just one click and it's very clear where the public can now go and find all the recordings from the last six months of the meetings that had not been on the website previously. And we are moving to get similarly the last six months of presentations posted and um, we will continue to get that done in the near term. Great. Can I request, just given that we do have kind of a core of folks who take their own time and are regularly at this meeting, I'm looking at all of them right now, and there are others, if we could just email those to them, because I think they've been asking for this repeatedly, and I'm, I'm concerned that we are not being as responsive as we need to be, so that's my request. Yes, we could do that. Great. I do have. Yes. Um, I, I did want to be very clear on um, the direction staff has received. I, do believe there's clarity on items two, three, and four to proceed in the um, ordinance draft along the lines as indicated in the presentation. Item one, um, I believe at this point um, I have not received clarity to proceed um, with a phase in approach, but if I'm incorrect. I think that's correct. I think we do not have board alignment on that as yet. I'm hearing that Larry Bragman um, would like to have a little bit more information. Um, I hear that Larry Russell is more comfortable with the no phase in approach. Um, I remain a little agnostic. I'm willing to go along with the board, I mean, sorry, with the staff recommendation. I think Jack is, I'm just summarizing for all you guys. You should feel free to jump in. But I'm just trying to, you know, 
see if I if I've correctly captured where everybody is at. Um, so I am, uh, you know, I am comfortable with um, Larry Bragman's request to receive more information. I'm not confident that it's going to be, you know, significantly different than the bookends we've already discussed. But I don't have an objection to staff developing it. Um, I'm also sympathetic to Larry Russell's um, concern about um, moving forward. Um, at, well, let's just say rather his preference to moving forward um, with an unfazed approach. Um, and I think we've heard from the public at least several members who are more comfortable with that approach as well. So I think that at least from where I'm sitting, what I'm hearing, there is not board alignment on this. Have I captured everybody's views correctly? There's no consensus, if that's what you're saying. Uh, I uh, do agree I mean. there's no consensus. However, I am very concerned that it's my understanding that there's time sensitivity here to meet the deadlines we have set out in this. So um, uh, I'm hearing the worst of all possible alternatives, which is delay. Um, I don't think I'm, it's delay as much as I think we just this is an issue. I think we've ground down. Do we meet to what the time? The um, we do have um, a, a meeting in mid-May. I believe it's the 14th. Is that correct? Um, where we could um, bring additional information. Um, I was um, alternatively. I was imagining from the discussion that the staff would receive direction today along the lines of item one with the board's understanding that that could shift um, where we um, it would be quite difficult to um, bring an ordinance of course on may 28th with this level of uncertainty right so i, I agree with that i think that you've got a little bit more work to do to bring the board into alignment and of course director quintero is not here so um, I guess my recommendation back to staff would be to bring something well in advance of the May 14th meeting. And that'll give you enough time? Yeah. Today is whatever today is, the 25th, so you've got a little time. But I, I agree that there's some work to be done to build a consensus. And I think we're all in agreement about there not being yet a consensus on the board about how to proceed exactly with item one. I do think we've drilled down to um, some fairly discrete issues. So I think we've, I guess I, if I was going to put the most positive um, light on this, I would say that we have narrowed the, um, the issues underneath that particular item, but we have not yet landed on a consensus. Is that a fair description, fellow board members? Okay. Larry has one more thing to say. <laughs> one of the many, many, many Larrys. <laughs> Larry Minikin. <laughs> I think there was a misunderstanding as to what I said. Okay. What I said was that we've been underfunding this. For, okay. I never said we weren't taking care of infrastructure. Okay. We're bonded. We've been doing that. Okay. And even today, we're underfunding because we've got two-thirds needs that we're not even talking about in this room today. Two-thirds needs that aren't even being discussed. And here you're talking primarily about the watershed. I'm talking, no, I'm talking okay. about infrastructure. I'm well, talking about the, the three, to be about the 300 miles of pipeline, for example, that needs to be replaced, the nine old tanks that, that uh, Director Russell spoke to, all of those things that, that we're not addressing today. 5.1 miles is not going to get us very far in 10 years. And I've said this before, because in 10 years, we're going to have another 50 or so miles, if not more, that's going to be replaced. So we're sort of standing in place. And that was my point, is that we, we've been underpricing the cost of water for decades. And what's happened now is we're sitting here having this discussion. That's what I said earlier. I never. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. And Fair I'm, enough. I'm, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. I'm just from yeah. where I sit, we've replaced what? Yeah. Three dozen tanks just in the time I've been here. Right. So you can't do it all in one year. No it's, it's, it's happening. Right. It's, it's happening. We're funding it. You know, we're not going at the pace that you want. But I think I'm, I'm just concerned about a negative, about a narrative in the public that is simply not true. And that is that we're simply not doing anything. I've that read over not, and over again. We have our representative here from the IJ, who I'm right. certain can share that I'm correct about this. If you read nothing but the IJ, you would think that we were doing absolutely nothing here whatsoever with the public funds, but just sitting around twiddling our thumbs, and getting all of this. Um, you know, and it's simply not true. Quote that. So, um, 
it's just wrong. It's just false. And we have been we have been funding infrastructure no. along and along. I and I just think it's an important thing to get through to the public. Right. I, I'm sorry, but I don't I don't really see that in the IJ articles. I, 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 okay. Because you're sitting in that spot. I know it's more sensitive. I'm not sensitive at all. I'm just no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'll, I'll stop you. Okay. okay. Anything else on this item? Okay. With that, we're moving on to item four. It's going to be a real letdown for everybody. We are moving on to PG&E's safety power shutoff program.